grandpa glasses. Yeah. They look terrible. I was like, I left my glasses in my, my bag today. But I luckily had these spare pair. This is my old okay. pair. So I, I just, oh, right, I threw the old pair in the car just for emergencies. <laughs> I was like, emergency, like, looking okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. It's a bad choice, but I've never gotten to know you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, right. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit, like, looking over the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Over the wall. Yeah, yeah. Like that. All righty. And am I already on? Oh, already on now? Testing one, two, three. Sound good? All right. Good. I'm going to sleep, especially because I have equations. So yeah. <laughs> you've got to do anything you can to keep them awake. Mm -hmm. Cool, look at us. There we go. Yep, and you, you can hear me? Yes. Cool. This is a good volume, actually. Oh, hello, hello.
Okay. Can you hear me? Ooh, sounds tinny. <laughs> it's a little scary. That sounds a little undead. It's a question of how near or far to. Okay, is this better? Yeah? Am I near enough? I shouldn't get too near it. I feel like when I get too near, it's kind of a little tinny. So is, it's okay if I just stand here? You're hearing me okay? No? That's perfect. Okay, great.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Bernie Dunker. I'm the Associate Vice President of Interdisciplinary Research at the University of Waterloo, and I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to the Bridges Lecture. Um, the Bridges Lecture is a marvelous series that's returning for its ninth year going strong here at St. Jerome's, and that's a testament to the success of a fantastic partnership between St. Jerome's University and the University of Waterloo faculties of arts, math, and science. And I have to say, I have introduced quite a few talks in my time at Waterloo, 19 years now, but never one quite like this. So this is kind of like a bucket list item, I'd say, for myself. Tonight, we are having a couple of talks on zombies, monsters with meaning. So we have two terrific speakers, and I'm going to tell you a bit about both of them now. So our first speaker is Dr. Arnold Bloomberg, AKA Doctor of the Dead. He's a world-renowned zombie scholar, co-author of Zombie Mania, 80 Movies to Die For, which is one of the first exhaustive guides to zombie cinema that helped to define the parameters of what qualifies as a zombie movie. Not any old movie can qualify as a zombie movie, so there are rules. And he's also the author of Journey of the Living Dead, a tribute to 50 years of flesh eaters, a comprehensive survey of zombie cinema and the ways in which the genre has impacted the modern media landscape. He has appeared in documentary films as well as on TV, radio, and online, and taught a course, I'm really jealous, uh, in zombies and popular media um, at the University of Baltimore that garnered worldwide press coverage and offered a fun way to teach students to think more deeply and critically about the media they consume, ha ha. Uh, he has contributed <laughs> chapters to Triumph of the Walking Dead, Brains, From Academics to Zombies, edited by our other speaker, Dr. Robert Smith, and The Undead and Theology, which was a Stoker Award nominee, and the, um, his zombie and horror podcast, Doctor of the Dead, is available via iTunes and other podcast apps. He can be find, found on Twitter at, at Doctor of the Dead. Our second speaker is Dr. Robert Smith. He's a professor of disease modeling at the University of Ottawa, my alma mater. And he uses mathematics to study infectious diseases such as HIV, malaria, human papillomavirus, neglected tropical diseases, and of course, zombies. He has published 15 books on academia and pop culture, is the author of almost 100 academic publications, is a winner of a Guinness World Record for his work on modeling a zombie invasion, uh, was the winner of the 2015 Mathematics Ambassador Award given by Canada's Partners in Research Association, won the 2018 Society for Mathematical Biology Distinguished Service Award for exceptional contribution to the field of mathematical biology and its advancement outside of research. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker and ask Doctor of the Dead to please take the stage. Thank you very much, everybody. You hear me all right? Is this working? Oh, there we go. Well, I am going to try to lay the groundwork for you tonight. Um, about why zombies have become such a phenomenal pop culture phenomenon. Uh, and I'm going to have to do it kind of quickly, uh, so forgive me if some of this seems like a bit of a whirlwind, uh, but I usually have a whole semester to do stuff, so <laughs> I'm trying to crash down a little bit. But um, anyway, I'm going to take you through the timeline a little bit. Zombies have become, in the 21st century, uh, just one of the most perfect go-to forms for exploring human nature and telling stories that enable us to reflect on who we are as people. And using this avatar of the zombie, something that looks like us, sometimes acts like us, that is clearly not quite us, has given us the opportunity to reflect on what it means to be human, and also things like, how would I survive in a survival apocalyptic scenario? Are we likely to turn on one another? Are we likely to join together? All these kind of questions that come up when you watch these kind of but in order to lay the groundwork for where it all came from, we have to go back almost exactly 100 years to look at the birth of this pop culture phenomenon. So 
I have a tendency to look backwards, so I'm sorry, actually. It's cold. Look forward. Um, but some of the earliest examples of the zombie in pop culture goes back a century or so. What you're looking at is actually a bit of a cheat because this is one of the earliest films that ever depicted the dead. But the man that made this, Abel Gantz, was sort of the George Lucas of his day. He couldn't stop tinkering with anything that he made, and so he kept revisiting it. And what you're actually looking at, as I said, a bit of a cheat, is a picture from a 1930s remake that he made of this film. But you can see that the version of these creatures that are in this image are much more like we almost associate with the popular modern-day zombie. They're these skull-like figures. They're paper mache skulls, though, so they're not going to convince anybody necessarily. But it's an early example of the dead coming back. They're not here to eat anybody. They're not technically the reanimated dead. They're spirits. But it's an early example of where this started. And another great example of this is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Not just one of the greatest horror movies ever made from that era, but also just generally regarded as one of the great examples of early cinema. It's a German expressionist film that's just a beautiful piece of work to look at, but it features this character on the left named Caesar, who is a somnambulist, a sleepwalker. And he's basically the slave to the mad scientist on the right. He will do anything the mad scientist tells him to do, even if it means murdering someone. He has no agency, no free will, no personality of his own. He's basically an automaton, a hollowed out shell of a human being. He is in many ways a prototype of the kind of character we now associate with the word zombie. But that word wasn't yet there, and so we have Caesar the Sleepwalker. Where zombie actually came from is uh, what's now very well documented as a great example of massive cultural appropriation. And what you're looking at is a gentleman by the name of William Seabrook. And I actually come from Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, we can sort of lay claim a little bit to a bit of uh, a local connection to the origins of the zombie. Not that we necessarily want to claim this man particularly, but he was born in Westminster, Maryland. Uh, and he was a self-styled adventurer and sociologist and newspaper journalist. And he traveled around the world and wrote very sensationalistic pieces about other cultures usually through the lens of a white man experiencing what he would consider a primitive or foreign or frightening other culture. And in one particular book that he wrote called The Magic Island in 1929, he told the story of his visit to the West Indies, to Haiti. And for most of the book, it's a compelling, if particularly narrow-minded, travelogue of that experience. However, in 12 pages of that book, he talks about being introduced to something called a zombie. And he learned about the local traditions that came to be called in Western culture voodoo, which was sort of a, a meshing together of multiple religious traditions, local tradition mixed with Catholicism, missionaries had come there several times. And the result was a bizarre amalgam of ideas. But sort of in there was this notion that you could contact the dead, that you could channel the dead through the living that someone could even volunteer to be a willing vessel for a spirit of a former loved one or an ancestor. But when you open that door, you also potentially open that door to an evil god or an evil spirit. Uh, the word zombie exists in several different African and Spanish languages going back to that time period. And in almost all cases, it actually is referring to a jar or a vessel in which you trap a spirit, sometimes a beneficent one, sometimes an evil spirit. And Seabrook was introduced personally to someone that they said was a zombie, a human being who had been enslaved and turned into this particular creature. Not dead, although some people thought it was a dead person that was reanimated, but a living human being. And at the core of this idea was something very real, because they were using narcotics to control these people, to rob them of their agency and of their personality, and turn them into slaves and send them to work in the cane fields. A person might find that their father or sister or brother had disappeared months ago only to pass by on the street and see them working out in the cane fields and think, my God, the dead have come back to life. But it was a living human being who was imprisoned and enslaved within their own body, within their own mind. This shocked and alarmed an entire generation of people in the Western world who were amazed that such a horrific thing was taking place, that this concept of the zombie could even happen. And out in the west coast of the United States, where the movie industry had just really gotten going, the reaction there was, we've got to do that. 
We, we need one of those. That sounds awesome. So the race was on to make a zombie movie. And keep in mind, of course, that for any of you that have that association we have today of the reanimated corpse that's coming back to eat people, none of that is in play here. What we're talking about are these zombies that William Seabrook had written about in The Magic Island, living human beings who were slaves. In essence, the very first pop culture zombies are a perfect metaphor for all of the disenfranchisement and enslavement and demonizing of another culture that unfortunately is still taking place today all around the world. And so, as I said, the race was on. And part of that came into play when Dracula came out in 1931, and we entered a true era of a sort of renaissance of horror in Hollywood, and a lot of it had to do with a particular production company, Universal Pictures, that was doing a lot of movies and would for a good decade and a half to come, exploring all of these creatures that we're familiar with, vampires, werewolves, the Frankenstein monster. This is Bela Lugosi here playing Dracula. He also played successfully on Broadway and then went into film. And at the time that he was doing this and became successful in this particular, uh, in this particular role, there were a group of producers out there who were looking for an opportunity to do a zombie movie, and they thought, if we could just get this guy and put something together, we might have a hit. And the result was a movie that one year after Dracula becomes the first official zombie movie that was ever produced, and it's called White Zombie. And there's Bella again. Uh, this time he's playing a character named Murder Legender. His first name in the story is actually Murder. Um, and I've never understood how that happens, like how a mother says, there's my baby, I'm going to call it murder. I don't know. But he's going to be a doctor. Anyway, so, so, so Murder Legender is a high priest in the West Indies. Short version of the story, basically, do you know the story of Dracula? Then you know White Zombie, because they basically ripped off Bram Stoker's story, transplanted it to Haiti, made a few other changes. But the White Zombie of the title is the young woman who comes with her fiancé to his inherited plantation in Haiti, only to become the victim of murder legender and virtually every other male character in the movie that wants to possess her. She is an object. She herself is deprived of agency long before she becomes a zombie. And the idea that we can explore in that movie, again, something that translates very well to the present, is a look at how gender plays a role in this particular tale. They're all after her as a prize to be won. She is the white zombie of the title. Nobody in the movie, by the way, is particularly concerned about the hundreds and hundreds of other zombies roaming around who are themselves also enslaved victims. She's the one that we're focused on because she's white. So there's also racial issues at play in this film. And the people making this movie don't think they weren't uh, aware of the fact that they were making a social statement and when they were making the film. They were keenly aware of some of the things they were doing in making this film. Even in 1932, to take a look at through that lens. So it became a hit, but a modest hit. And for a while, that was the zombie in pop culture, a representation of a different culture's religious traditions fed through the sensationalism of stories like Seabrook's The Magic Island and turned into a monster that white audiences could go to and say, uh, I cringe to think that such a thing exists in this world. And it stayed that way for some time. Another great example. 11 years later, it's basically the same story. There's this film, I Walked with a Zombie in 1943. I Walked with a Zombie. Anybody here read Jane Eyre? Familiar with Jane Eyre? Then you know I Walked with a Zombie. It's Jane Eyre with zombies. That's basically, <laughs> which is exactly what it was. That was the remit given to the screenwriters. Do Jane Eyre, do a new adaptation of Jane Eyre, just move it to Haiti and make the wife a zombie. And that's what this movie is about. The guy you see on screen here, his name in the movie is Carrefour. He is a zombie, obviously. Um, he, is the he is the guide and the protector of the crossroads. Carrefour in French means crossroads. Well, I'm telling you people, why am I even saying this? I don't know French, you know French. Um, I know, it's crazy. Anyway, so uh, Carrefour guards the crossroads to the home fort where all the voodoo rituals take place. And he is a very ominous figure, but you might also notice he looks very benign. And he is actually, he is himself a victim. He is trapped in this role. He's not at all a monster. There are actually stories that were told at the time uh, of audiences going to see this movie and falling out of their seats when Carrefour does this one particular move during the film where he starts stalking toward the audience, toward the people 
out of the screen. People were supposedly just terrified just at the idea of this man walking toward them. He does nothing threatening. He's just existing. But he's a representation of the zombie that existed at that point in time. In order to get us to the kind of zombie we're familiar with in modern culture, the one you're likely to see on every episode of The Walking Dead, we have to move forward a little bit. And we have to go through the 1950s. During a time where the Cold War was definitely transforming American culture in particular and giving everybody this bizarre dichotomy of a culture that was looking forward to the future of atomic energy and power and everything that technology represented, and yet also being deathly afraid of what it might represent and the fear that the Soviet Union any day was going to press a button and send missiles hurling around the world. And during that time, there were a couple interesting films that came up. Basically, any alien invasion movies that took place during that time were metaphors for fears of communism, fears of atomic war, the Soviet Union. And most of them were usually aliens invading. Uh, we had a lot of movies about giant bugs, giant monsters. The Godzillas of the world were marching all around and basically examining the idea of nuclear threat through these creatures. And then we had a couple movies like this. Widely regarded as one of the worst movies ever made in the history of cinema is Plan 9 from Outer Space. They're right. It's really bad. Uh, but the core of the idea in this film is that aliens come to Earth and reanimate the corpses of the dead and use them as an army against us. These corpses don't eat the living. They don't have a lot of the features that people come to regard as common for the zombies that we know today but they are a new form of zombie for that era. They're no longer living human beings. They're the dead actually coming back to threaten the living. And there was another movie that same year that was exactly the same plot, exactly the same idea, called Invisible Invaders. Uh, and you'll notice the guys in here are all wearing their Natalie dressed in suits. Uh, and a few years later, one of the movies that would be quintessential to establishing the zombie as an icon in pop culture would feature zombies wearing suits, and the man who made it, George Romero, had seen Invisible Invaders years earlier. This is one of the movies that inspired him and in, uh, his thought process. And then we got to accelerate a little bit to get to where we're going. Carnival of Souls in 1962 is basically a feature-length version of a Twilight Zone episode in which a woman is threatened by these spectral beings that keep chasing her around a small town where she's waiting to have her car repaired after an accident. Spoiler alert, she's been dead the whole time. And there are ghosts coming to collect her because she died in the car accident. I saved you an hour and a half. There you go. Um, but it's not that good. It's okay. Uh, actually, it's pretty well respected. It's a, it's a tone poem of a movie. It's not a movie you watch necessarily for plot, but it's got a lot of atmosphere. But the creatures in it, again, sallow-faced, wearing suits. This is the vision that would shortly become the modern zombie for a lot of people and would take us very far away from that notion of the living human being impelled by voodoo or by drugs and enslaved in the West Indies. Uh, another film that does it is The Last Man on Earth. There's Vincent Price. Anybody familiar with Vincent Price, another horror star? Uh, the Last Man on Earth was the first of several adaptations of a book that had been published a few years earlier by Richard Matheson called I Am Legend. And you might be familiar with some of the other versions of that, including a Will Smith movie that was actually used the same title, I Am Legend. In this book, a plague sweeps around the entire planet. If only somebody could have figured out a way to mathematically model something like that <laughs> and predict it. But there was nobody like that around then. And it turns everybody into vampires overnight. Well, at the time this movie came out, the 1964 version, uh, once again, George Romero and some of his partners were sitting around and trying to come up with a movie to make. They wanted to make another adaptation of I Am Legend, and then they found out this horrible thing that happens, which is when you make an adaptation of an author's book, you usually have to pay them for it. And they decided, now nah, let's just steal it and make our own movie instead. And they began to develop a book, a, a, a script rather, that was, uh, went through several titles. It went through a title like Night of Anubis. There was a title Night of the Ghouls. There was already a movie Night of the Ghouls. They came through a couple other titles, and then eventually, they settled on the title Night of the Living Dead. This is, for all intents and purposes, our flashpoint. This is where the pop culture zombie that we are most familiar with today begins. And in this film, a group of reanimated corpses, the unburied dead, the movie is very careful to explain, too. We're not expecting people to claw out of the ground. They're coming from morgues, from, from mortuaries. 
They come back and for some bizarre reason, for reasons entirely unknown to us, they are compelled to eat the flesh of the living. They are now our own friends, our own relatives, our own selves coming back to consume us. This is an incredibly powerful metaphor. And it was the first time that someone had brought all of these elements together, some of which we saw in some of those earlier films I mentioned, and turned it into this very different creature who was now impelled individually to go after victims. There's some reference in the film to the fact that radiation from a returning space probe has reanimated them, but the filmmakers always insisted that wasn't something they really wanted people to think about too much. The idea was better and more powerful than any science fiction explanation. The dead were back, and they weren't interested in anything other than consuming us from within. This movie would take an entire lecture of its own for me to go through. It has in it a commentary on the era in so many ways. It came out after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. Um, the filmmakers themselves always told a story, whether it's true or not, that they actually heard about King while they were in the car delivering the prints of this film to the distributors for the first time. Uh, it features the man there on the screen, Dwayne Jones, as our lead hero at a time where no black man would have been the lead in a film unless that man was Sidney Poitier. He was the only one in Hollywood who was getting significant roles of any kind. Here's a black man as our lead hero. And add that to the fact that, again, spoiler alert, but the movie's 51 years old, so um, I'm going to tell you anyway. He dies at the end, shot by a white posse. And 51 years later, we're still talking about this movie. We're still exploring all of its many nuances. We're still looking at the fact that it is a pressure cooker of a film in which a group of people are all trapped in a house together and play out a variety of different roles that really illuminate what we'd be like in a crisis and how we react to one another. An entire American family, traditional 50s-style American family, virtually melts down on the screen right in front of you with the child consuming and destroying her parents. This was all a commentary on what was going on in this culture at that time. And all these years later, it's still relevant and it's still something that we look at. But it also led to an entirely new era of zombie storytelling. It was also remade quite a number of times. This is an image from a remake. Um, and then there's also this fascinating project that was done where for one of its anniversaries, they asked uh, about 100 artists around the world to create their own artistic visions of Night of the Living Dead and then edited them all together into a feature length presentation. And it's a fascinating look at how people reinterpret media that they love. I always like to throw that in because uh, it's hard to find, but it's well worth seeking out, particularly on an artistic level. It's an extraordinary piece of work. Shortly after Night of the Living Dead, the concept of the dead coming back in that form was something that started cropping up in tons of other films. This one is often overlooked, so I always like to point it out. It's a movie called Death Dream in 1974. And it's also considered one of the first films in history to try to treat with some degree of seriousness to the degree that you think a zombie film is serious, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's basically a feature-length version of The Monkey's Paw. Familiar with the story of The Monkey's Paw? In which somebody, well, short version too is that one of the wishes involves bringing someone back, but they're not too specific about how they come back, so they need to use that last wish to get rid of whatever it is that's coming back. Death Dream is a version of that translated to the Vietnam era. And we have a Vietnam vet coming home, only to be demonized by everyone around him as he finds he cannot re-enter his family life and his culture anymore. And many Vietnam vets felt that that movie represented a lot of what they were going through. There were many that were also angry at the movie for helping to turn them into monsters for audiences. But it depicted that idea in a very potent way, and it used a zombie as the focus. And then, and then George Romero and his partners came back 10 years after Night of the Living Dead and made Dawn of the Dead. I was just having this conversation earlier uh, tonight about this, is that although I often say Night of the Living Dead is our flashpoint for the concept of the modern zombie in pop culture, it's really this film, Dawn of the Dead, that establishes so many of the rules that people are most accustomed to. If you've ever heard any of the standard things about, you know, you got to shoot a zombie in the head, uh, you know, they're, they're shambling, they're slow, they're here to eat you. Dawn of the Dead has a lot more of that. And it also was one of the first times that somebody made a movie like this with a conscious decision to try to make a sociocultural statement. And the idea for this was, at this time in 1978, 
indoor shopping malls were just starting to become one of the big new phenomenon. And articles all across the country in the U.S. were saying, this is going to be the death of culture. Is the indoor Everything new is always the death of culture. So, so the indoor shopping mall is going to be the death of culture. And uh, they said, how, what a horrible thing this is. It's turning us all into mindless consumers who just trudge mindlessly up and down these hallways and stare at things and claw at them across. The and Romero and his team said, this sounds like a perfect thing for a zombie movie, which it was. Uh, they couldn't have possibly been at the right place at the right time in a better position to tell that story. And so they send a bunch of survivors of a zombie apocalypse into a local mall, and the zombies follow them. And the story became, again another flashpoint, and from this point on, pretty much, anybody after this who was telling a zombie story in film felt, we have to tell a story with some sort of meaning because they're gonna expect it. They're gonna expect that zombies are saying something, even if they're not very articulate. And Dawn of the Dead is where it started. And it was remade itself uh, in 2004, very different film, but it was remade, and itself is a very successful post 9-11 commentary. I'll get to that again in a minute, uh, if I can manage to go fast enough. Um, I throw this in mainly because I like to share this visual. There's a weird boom at the time where because of the success of Dawn of the Dead in Italy, uh, there was a huge boom in zombie movies in Italy. Uh, the Italian filmmaking industry would often make dozens and dozens of copycat films for whatever was popular at the time. Right after Jaws, they did tons of killer shark movies. Um, and then the zombies happened, and they did tons of zombie movies, including movies like with this guy. Um, but this particular film also featured uh, zombie versus shark. So <laughs> I had to share that with you. Uh, it was a draw, by the way. It was, it was, they both agree to walk away. Um, that's, a, that's a real guy in zombie makeup who was the shark handler fighting a real shark for your entertainment, so. But uh, I, I certainly, when I have more time, I would delve more into, there's, there's a deeper meaning. Part of what I teach is all sorts of things about media literacy and the idea that we need to examine with some seriousness the things that we too often tend to discard as escapism. And obviously one of the things I'm trying to point out here is that the zombie is this amazing vehicle for exploring different things in history and culture. Uh, I can't honestly say there's much in this movie that I can point to that has meaning, but I'm, I'm sure that there's something in the zombie versus shark. Then we get to the 1980s. So up until this point, uh, the zombie is itself a niche within a niche. Horror is a genre that is all about taboo. It's about pushing buttons people don't want pushed. It's about doing things that are often offensive or shocking or in other ways off-putting to people. Um, I grew up at a time where I was going like the video store, like going, you know, renting videotapes, and horror would always be shelved in like the back corner near the door for the pornography. That's the way it was treated. It was treated as like, you should be ashamed of this. This is something put in the background. And then the question is, how does a zombie, which was often considered the worst of the worst, because we're dealing with one of the greatest taboos of all, death, and the death body itself, just a horrible thing to conceive of. Um, how does it go from that point to becoming The Walking Dead, a show that was the most popular show for the last several years for everyone between the ages of 18 and 49? It's an extraordinary thing. Part of that leap to that level of uh, credibility and integrity and in storytelling comes in the 1980s, and it comes largely thanks to this man. Now, absent anything else, we may talk about him uh, in, in other venues for other reasons, fact of the matter is that Michael Jackson did an extraordinary amount to, to mainstream the zombie into pop culture in a way that had never happened until that point. And it was through his video for Thriller, title song from his album. I'm still not sure, actually. I think it's still the highest selling album of all time. I'm not sure. Um, but when he made the video, he was a huge horror fan. And at a time when MTV was becoming ubiquitous for its depiction of music in visual form, it was this perfect marrying of all these forces, and he decided for Thriller to make a 14, 15 minute short film instead of just a video. He brought in a legitimate film director who had directed horror movies before. He brought in Rick Baker, who was an extraordinary makeup artist who'd done horror films before. And they made, at one point in the, in the video, the group of zombies, and yes, they dance. They dance, but 
But the thing that's amazing about that dance is that even though they're dancing, they look like some of the most frightening zombies anybody had ever seen up to that point because when this is one of the key elements, the video took it seriously. They weren't parodying the concept. They weren't satirizing it. He wanted them to look, for lack of a better word, real. And so the result was an entire generation of kids watching MTV for the first time saw the living dead on their screens round the clock and it transformed things, not entirely all the way to Walking Dead level, but close. And shortly after that, there was a rash of movies that came out in the 80s that really started to spread the gospel of zombies in a variety of ways. There's Night of the Comet, which is also sort of distinctive, too, for having two strong female lead characters in the film at a time where that didn't often happen. This is being remade, actually. Um, with a female director as well, and should be interesting to see how a modern voice looks back at this film, which is very distinctly 80s. And then we reach 1985, which for some reason is a concentration of zombie entertainment unlike almost anything we've ever seen. And some of the movies that came out during that year were George Romero's third film, Day of the Dead. The guy you're looking at there named Bub was a zombie that started to recall things about his past life. He was starting to get in touch with his humanity. And that is a vehicle for exploring interesting things about identity and the idea of who we are. Is there someone trapped in that body and does it make sense to shoot them if perhaps there's still a person in there? And that's the question that starts to come up in that film. There are a number of others uh, that I don't necessarily have time to go into in too much depth, Reanimator. Um, but then there's also this movie, Return of the Living Dead. George Romero's writing partner for Night of the Living Dead, John Russo, had made a deal with him years earlier that they could both go off and make their own sequels to Night of the Living Dead as the years went on. Russo kind of faded away for a while. Romero went on and made Dawn and Day and other things. And then Russo finally made his sequel to Night of the Living Dead, and he called it Return of the Living Dead. And if you've ever heard of the idea of zombies eating brains, or the idea of zombies moaning brains, this is the movie where that all started. This one specific film invented the idea that they are specifically after the brain. And I'll leave it to you to watch the movie to figure, find out why that is, but there's a reason. Um, they wanted to provide a reason. It's also, though, strangely enough, uh, besides being an incredibly dark film and also incredibly funny film, it has comedy, it has rock music, it's a bizarre amalgam of multiple things all thrown together, and it's very much a distillation of the 80s in so many ways, including the fact that it was also reflective of a ramping up of tension between us and the Soviet Union. It is a very nihilistic, nuclear-driven film, and it has all of those things captured. In the picture of this one particular zombie, too, this guy who's referred to as the Tar Man, they are the most indestructible zombies in the genre's history. There's literally nothing you can do to stop them. And that's how a lot of people felt for a time in the 80s, where it felt like there was nothing that could stop a nuclear annihilation. And then the 90s got kind of quiet as far as zombies are concerned. Um, and uh, I'm reaching close to my time, so I'm going to go a little faster here. But I'll say the 90s were a dark period for zombies in the sense that there wasn't a lot going on. You can argue uh, many different reasons why that might be, but certainly there were certain... There was a certain level of stability in 90s culture that led to uh, a lack of horror filmmaking that expressed uh, tension or strife. You can map a lot of the popularity of these things to whenever we're going through a particularly dark or tumultuous period, wars, financial collapse, that sort of thing. And then 9-11 happened. And post 9-11, the zombies have come back with a vengeance. 28 days later in 2002, which was a British film, Resident Evil started a run of six movies throughout the 2000s, itself based on games. George Romero was given an actual budget for a change and came back to do Land of the Dead in 2005. Meanwhile, over in the comic book world, a guy named Robert Kirkman started a comic called The Walking Dead. And all of this is reflective of a post-9-11 world in which terrorism, the threat of anthrax, of biological plague around the world, uh, just ramped things up to such a degree that the zombie was, again, the perfect distillation of all those fears. And very often, the zombie was running now. Not shambling along slowly, but running. It was in keeping with the pace of the fear and the terror that people were feeling. And during this time, there were a number of others. There's a Spanish film uh, from 2007. I'm actually going to... Uh, George Romero did a found footage movie called Diary of the Dead. 
And the last thing I'm going to leave you with as I go very, very quickly through the end is that when you keep a monster around long enough to reflect your fears and also cathartically process your fear, which is how we deal with these things, you go to these movies and watch stuff in the same way that you go on a roller coaster ride. You're processing that fear through the fictional experience and then you leave the theater, you're okay. But if you leave them around long enough, as we have ever since 9-11, you start to also explore curing the zombie or finding a way to identify with the monster. And there are a number of movies that added more comedy or added romance and tried to make the zombie into a palatable creature. Shaun of the Dead and Zombieland are great examples of adding comedy in and bringing it into a more modern context. And then there's a movie like Warm Bodies where the zombie becomes a romantic icon. And this is basically Romeo and Juliet in zombie form. His name is R, her name is Julie, it's not subtle. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, things also get uh, epic and global. World War Z is a very biblical zombie film with a lot of religious imagery. That image you're looking at is of the zombies swarming virtually like a, a swarm of ants over a wall in Jerusalem, but they're also very much like a flood. And the lead character in it is also a very Christ-like figure who's messianic. And so there's a lot of commentary going on on all different levels with so many of these films as I ramp through these things pretty quickly. Zombies have found their home most frequently lately on television with The Walking Dead, which leapt to TV from comics in 2010. It has a spinoff. There's another one coming. And there have also been a number of other zombie series on television, including this one with a very self-aware zombie who is also solving crimes because it's... Every other television show is legally required to be a police procedural, so we do that. Uh, and it has also expanded to uh, f all sorts of other things, novels, games, even games that don't have zombies in them as part of the premise now like to add levels or patches and say, here's your zombie expansion. And basically, the, the one thing I would leave you with at the end of all this is that the core element of the concept of the zombie as a pop culture icon is and this may sound very simplistic, but it's one that the movies like to shoehorn in every chance they get. We are them, and they are us. It's through that creature and the fact that it is a hollow shell that we can explore and examine our own fears and our own culture in any era. And you can also look back at earlier examples of it and look at it through the lens of today and say, what does this tell us about not only then, but about us now? And that's how the zombie functions in pop culture. And one of the things people tend to ask me is, what's the next version of the zombie? What's going to happen you know, another 10 years? And my answer is very simple. If we could predict what we're going to be afraid of in the next 5 to 10 to 20 years, that lets you know what the zombie is going to look like. And unfortunately, we're not likely to run out of fear anytime soon. The zombie is spreading around the world and at a very, uh, well, I'd say at a very predictable rate, but I think someone else can explain better for you exactly how that works, so I'll leave him to it. Thank you very much. The zombies in as fast and as efficient a way as we possibly can, or perhaps as desperate a way as we possibly can. But if we want to be a little bit smarter about it, we're going to have to use something much more powerful. We're going to have to use mathematics. Right? So this is where we have to understand what the zombie is, what the zombie does, and we've luckily been given a bit of an overview of how zombies have worked in the past. Right? So while well, I have a short history of zombie outbreaks, but I think we've had a long history of zombie outbreaks so far, uh, I'm going to develop a mathematical model for the zombies. So this is where the really powerful tools in mathematics are going to come in. Uh, I'm going to refine this model several times to provide more realism. Um, I'm going to have a number of interventions. There'll be quarantine, treatment, and what I'm going to call impulsive attacks. Um, and then we'll discuss some implications. OK, well, what is a zombie? I think we all know by now. But uh, for my purposes, I'm going to think of a zombie as a reanimated corpse that feeds on living flesh. Right? So as we've seen, these are from you know, African and Caribbean belief systems of voodoo. Right? So they have a long history, which has been ably demonstrated by my collaborator here. Um, but you can recognize a zombie quite easily. Right? So when a zombie walks in the room, you know about it. Right? You, it's a creature with you know, organs and bodily functions operating at minimal levels. Right? So now, that's quite distinct from the vampire. So who here is a vampire? 
Yeah, okay, well, you're, of course you're not going to tell me, right? Because I don't know. Now, I know there are no zombies here because I can look at you and know there aren't any zombies in here. So we're, we're thankfully lucky, all right? So the one great thing about zombies is I know one when I see one, okay? So I can identify them. They're mindless monsters that don't feel pain. Uh, they have an immense appetite for human flesh. They're one of our natural predators, right? Their aim is to kill, eat, or infect us. And we can recognize them quite easily. They move in small, shambling steps. They show signs of physical decomposition, such as rotting flesh, discolored eyes, and open wounds. Okay. So, great. Right. At least I know one when I see one. And that's really important, actually, as we'll see. Okay, so, well, we've seen a number of historical documents that my, my collaborator has outlined. Um, so, the earlier systems of zombies, you know, were not quite the same as the modern zombie. The modern zombies primarily existed since 1968. Um, so this is largely in the US and the UK. Um, these involve zombies overwhelming isolated farmhouses, shopping malls, and of course British pubs. Right? <laughs> so we have, we have many historical documents that tell us all about how these work, and so we can use the information from those documents to understand what to do in the future. Okay, so what are zombies caused by? Well, there's many theories. So there is possibility of radiation from a Vita space probe or a virus in chimpanzees. But mostly what happens is the zombies are here, they're overwhelming us, and we stop wondering about where they came from and start worrying about how to defeat them. Right? So the ways in which we can defeat them, right? there's a number of ways. There are guns, the army, eventual starvation, and of course, Dire Straits records. Right? So we can use all the tools at our disposal to try and attack the zombies. And this is exactly what we will do when a zombie walks in the room. We will just throw whatever we can at it, run the other way, do whatever we need to to destroy the zombie. Right? Now, that's not a very efficient process, right? because we're each going to try and do that. And if we're you know, each moderately successful, we can hold off a small number. Right? I can probably beat a zombie in a, in a reasonable fight. Right? I maybe can take care of two zombies. If it's me versus 10 zombies, I'm not going to do so well. Right? If it's me versus 100, well, I surrender to our new zombie overlords, and thank you very much. Right? So I'm, I'm going to become a zombie at that point. Right? So the, the odds are not in my favor if it's sheer numbers. So how can mathematics help us? So here. I'm going to think of you know, solving any biological problem. Right? So I'd like to solve this problem. Right? I can do it any way I like, but what I can do is I can translate it into a mathematical model. And I am going to think of it as a translation. Right? And like any translation, it's imperfect. Right? I'm, I'm changing languages. I'm changing to this very dense language, mathematics. Right? So of course, that's a hard language to learn. Uh, but it's a very powerful language because it gives me access to things like logic and rigor. And so when I do my mathematical analysis, I lead inexorably to a conclusion. And my premise may be false, but my conclusion is absolutely true based on that premise. So the, the great thing about mathematics is I can trust this. This process is, is reliable. Right? I will turn it back to my biological conclusion, say, well, now I have an answer to my question that maybe I couldn't have got in any other way. Right? And then I can compare with data and say, well, maybe I could reason my way through it. And does this answer make sense? Right? And I could sort of say, you know, could I have got there without the mathematics? And maybe I can argue my way through it. Uh, but you might discover that actually this doesn't make sense. You may say your answer is not the answer that we were expecting, and maybe it's a nonsense answer. And if it's wrong, where is it wrong? Right? Now, I'm going to argue that the, the mathematical process, of course, is very robust. Right? This translation across the bottom is very easy. Right? So if you know, x is 7, I have 7 survivors. Right? That's an easy one. It's the top one that's the problem. Right? So making this, this translation from my biological problem over to my mathematical model. That's a very imperfect process. So if that's not so good, maybe I didn't include some things. Maybe I included them in not the best way. Right? What I might do is go around my cycle a few times. Right? I might make a new model, do a new analysis, find a new conclusion, come back to the biology, compare that with data, and keep doing this until I'm satisfied with the model that I found and see if the conclusions make sense and so on. All right. So what we need to understand is basically what goes in and what goes out. Right? So how do you make a zombie? Right? How do you lose a zombie? Right? So we lose zombies by killing them. Right? We make a zombie by either infection or reanimating the dead. How do we get humans? Right? So humans, of course, are born, or maybe they move from somewhere else, if you're considering a limited geographic region. Right? And humans can be lost by contact with a zombie. Right? So my zombie is created in two possible ways. Uh, and susceptible humans can, of course, die from natural causes. And the dead come into play in the model here. So the dead become zombies well, right? So, uh, but I can also kill the zombies if you know I fight off a zombie as well. So there are lots of movements happening here, right? My humans are changing into zombies, or maybe changing into the dead. The zombies have 
becoming zombies from humans, but they're also dying. The dead are coming back to life. So there's lots of things at play, right? So, and of course, death may mean either temporary death or permanent death, right? So I may, I may be very good at killing zombies. I may, you know, cut off the head and, you know, shoot the zombie in the head, but I may not be quite so good, right? I may kill the zombie temporarily, but it can get back up and chase after me, right? So I'm going to account for two possible deaths here. Okay, so here are some friendly Canadians, right? And what can happen to us, right? Well, we could die, and that's kind of a shame, especially if I'm one of them, right? Um, or we could become zombies, right? <laughs> so these are basically the two possible things in life. I mean, you know, life is short and, and you know, brutish. Um, and the zombies can die, either temporarily, so they could go back into the same death class and therefore be reanimated back as zombies again, or they could die permanently, and then they just leave the system altogether. So, okay, I just showed you a mathematical model, right? Doesn't look so scary, no equations, no Greek letters and so on, right? But I have my model, right? And the great thing about this is I can kind of have a discussion with biologists and experts in zombie law and so on and say, is this good enough? Should I put more things in? You know, have I encountered something the right way? So on. And we can, we can discuss this without them needing to be mathematical experts. Right? So this is very handy, actually. Okay, so let me just basically reformulate this in a slightly better way. Right? So here's my model again. Right? I have susceptible humans. I have the zombies, which is my infected class. And I have a removed class, which in this case is the dead. So the, for historical reasons, we call R the removed class. Usually it means people who've recovered from the disease, right? But it can also mean the dead if you're counting the dead. But in the zombie case, of course, the dead are an active variable. So these are my three state variables, and I have various parameters. Right? I have some birth rate or possibly immigration rate. Right? So that's how humans come in. That's the only way to become a human is to come in here. And then you have two possible ways to leave. You can either become a zombie, so that means a human and a zombie meet, and there's an encounter, and there's a probability of infection. So with zombies, that probability is pretty high. Right? If a zombie bites me, I'm pretty likely to become a zombie. Right? Uh, but I could also die of natural causes. Right? And so if I die, I am susceptible to becoming a zombie again. Right? So the dead reanimate, and that creates a zombie from a different way. So I move from the R class back to the Z class. Right? Now, humans can also kill zombies. So this is something that you don't see in most diseases. Usually we don't kill people with the flu to try and solve the problem of the flu, right? You get into big trouble from that. I learned the hard way. Don't, don't do that, right? But in zombies, this is quite ethical, and so we're allowed to kill our zombies. Uh, what it means mathematically is that we have a more complicated term. So you can see that this, on the, on the left-hand side, there's the beta SZ, means I have to have a human S and a zombie Z. If I didn't have any humans, no zombies would be created. If I didn't have any zombies, no humans would be created. Right? So I need the S and the Z in there. The beta tells me how likely this is to occur. The alpha S said down the bottom, that says, again, I need a human to kill a zombie. So if I had no zombies, then none would die. If I had no humans to kill them, none would die. Right? So I have these two complicated terms. That's, as well as being obviously specific to the zombies, is something we don't see in other models very much, right? because we're not, we're not interacting with the infected class in this kind of way. OK, so I'm going to write my model a third time. And this time, I'm writing it in a condensed form, right? which is the same as the other two. In fact, this is exactly the same as the previous slide. I've just written it in more, more easily available sense. Right? So what's happening on the left-hand side of the three equal signs are the rate of change. This is telling me how the humans change, how the zombies change, and how the dead change. Right? Because in biology, things always change. Right? So I need to know how things move around. And again, I'm just accounting for what comes in and what goes out. All the things that come in will be positive. All the things that go out will be negative. Right? So you can see in the first line, the birth rate is pi. That's the only way to come into being a human. The way to go out is to either be infected or to die. The zombie class, I come in by being infected. I also come in by reanimating the dead, and I go out by being killed by a human. If I'm in the dead class, I came in from dying from natural causes, and then I go, well, I, I come in from temporary death. So this, this P here is the percentage of people, the percentage of zombies who are not killed permanently. So I've killed P of them permanently. They're out of the model. The one minus P remain. And then I leave by reanimation. So the very last term is I leave the dead class and I go back into the Z class. So some terms appear in two cases because they're moving around, and anything that comes in from outside or goes out forever doesn't appear again. OK, so the key factor here is I have two complicated terms. I have one for infection and one for death. Right? So, sorry, death, yeah, temporary death or permanent death, but one for the attack by humans. And so P here represents permanent death. So I've, I've taken the 
P percentage of zombies out of the model, that's why they don't appear. Only one minus P do. Okay, so I've got a model, great. Let me analyze it and let me get some conclusions. Right. Well, before I do that, I'm gonna make a couple of simplifications. Right. One is the time scale. So now, when a zombie comes in the room, right, we're gonna try and deal with this problem very quickly. Right. We would like to attack the zombie or run away or do whatever we do. We're not gonna wait around for nine months for babies to be born. We're probably not gonna wait for people to die of cancer and heart attacks and all sorts of things. So we can say people dying for background reasons Maybe it's important, but maybe it's not. Maybe we can simplify that and say dying of, of natural causes is probably not likely to happen. Now, you may have a heart attack because you saw a zombie, but we would probably count that as a disease-related death. Right? We're also not going to wait around for babies to be born. Now, maybe if somebody is nine months pregnant and you know, the zombie gives them a bit of a shock, the water breaks and so on, but that's going to be an outlying case. Right? So on the whole, we're not going to need the demographics. Right? So to ignore the demographics, we're going to set the birth rate and the natural death rate to be zero. It also makes our model a little easier. Right. So I'm going to assume that 90% of zombie deaths are permanent. I'm assuming we are very good at killing zombies. Right. 90% is a pretty good hit rate. Okay. Um, I'm also going to assume that zombies bite us 10 times faster than we can kill them. Right. Zombies are better at attacking us than we are at killing them. Right. I mean, you know, if you've ever fired a gun, it's really hard to hit a thing. Right. I've tried shooting a tin can with my brother's gun. It's really difficult. And that tin can sat still. Right. <laughs> and I didn't hit it. Right. And mostly when you know, people are taught to shoot, they shoot for the largest area. Well, that's no use, right? <laughs> so you hit the zombie here, it really doesn't matter. You've got to hit the zombie in a very specific spot. So everybody thinks they're going to be great at killing zombies, but in practice, I don't think that's true. And even a slow-moving zombie that's shambling around, you know, even the tin can is hard to hit. The shambling zombie, it's hard to hit precisely. So we're not going to be that great at killing them. Okay, so what I would like to do first is look for equilibria. So that's where things are in stasis. So I'd like to know when nothing is moving, right, so there's no change anymore, well, I have two possible equilibria. I have a disease-free equilibrium, so that's an equilibrium, meaning nothing is changing, and it's disease-free, which means I have no zombies. Right? So that means I have only humans, no zombies, and no dead. Great, that is hopefully the equilibrium we are sitting in right now, right? where we have no zombies, so we continue to have no zombies. And that's you know, exactly as it's going to be forever, unless I change my initial conditions. So if I introduce a zombie, I may disturb that, and then I would like to know what's going to happen next. Do I go back to this equilibrium, or do I move away from it? So I have another equilibrium, which I'm going to call the doomsday equilibrium, right? And this says I have no humans, I have no dead, and everybody's a zombie. The zombies have converted, you know, every human, and they've also reanimated all the dead. So the zombies have really taken over. Right? So if everyone's a zombie, nothing changes. Everybody remains a zombie. There's nobody to kill the zombies, nobody dies, so therefore nobody reanimates. Right? So in either of these two states, I stay in these two states forever. What I'd like to know is what happens between the two states. Right? What if I have some zombies, but not everyone? Right? Which one do I head towards? Well, what I can prove mathematically is that my disease-free equilibrium is unstable, and my doomsday equilibrium is stable. This is not good. Right? <laughs> this means all it takes for this room is to have one zombie in here, and we're in big trouble. Right? That zombie is going to be better at attacking us than we are at attacking them. We might deal with that zombie, but by the time we have, that zombie's probably bitten a couple of us. Right? If it's bitten three of us, okay, we've taken out one zombie, now we've got to take out three of them. Okay, we maybe take out a couple, but it's bitten, those ones have bitten a few more, and the, the virus spreads very quickly. Right? Even if we're still killing them, they're still taking over us. Right? So that's very likely to happen in this case. Okay, so if we start with a city of a million people, and we start with a single zombie, after four days, we're all dead. Well, <laughs> maybe we're undead. Right? Now you can see what happens. So, so not everyone has become a zombie. Right? So, so there's, there's a slightly less zombies than there were humans. That's because we've killed some of them. Remember, we were 90% effective at killing zombies. Right? But look how good we've got. That's because we ran out of us pretty quickly. Right? So each individual can kill 90%, but there's not so many individuals after four days. Right? So the prognosis is not very promising. All right. So, well, let's go back and refine the model. So let's add in some things that we know about zombies, and my colleague has aptly illustrated many qualities of zombies, so let's put a few of them in. Right? So one of them, which we all know, is that there's a time between getting infected and being infectious. Right? So if I'm bitten by a zombie, right, what's gonna happen? Right? Well, I will start shaking and moaning and control, you know, rubbing myself and being, uh, and my friends will absolutely fail to notice anything wrong. <laughs> it just happens, right? So 
We have no idea that anything's going on. And then inexorably, I will become a zombie and start attacking my friends. All right, that's just going to happen. So that, that period is about 12 hours. I mean, that period can vary depending on which documents you're looking at. Uh, but we sort of chose 12 hours as, a, as an average from all the ones. OK, so what's the effect of putting in a 12-hour delay for each infection event? All right, so each infection is now delayed by 12 hours. Well, we take our model. Right, we take exactly the same model as before with the S and the Z and the R and all the transfers, but now we've added in a new class, which is the infected individuals who are not yet infectious. So they can't make any new zombies, but when a human is converted, they first go to this I class and then they go to the Z class. Right? So there's an activation rate here which transfers them from I to Z. Okay, so let's write down our model. And similar to before, but now we've added in a new class. Right? So the, the beta SZ now transfers into the I first. While you're in I, you could, of course, die of natural causes. Right? So you're still a human. That's still possible. I will, of course, set that to be zero for my time scale issues. But I'll come back and talk about what the, what the limitations of that are at the end. Um, and then we activate. So the, the row I sends us into the Z class. Right? That's the activation rate. Um, and I'm going to take my short time scale for now and set my birth and death rates to be zero. Okay. So what's the outcome? Well, I have a disease-free equilibrium, again, right? So now I have humans, but no infected, no zombies, no dead, fine. Um, I also have my doomsday equilibrium, where everyone's a zombie, so there's no humans, no infected, no dead. Right? And, well, my disease-free equilibrium is always unstable. So that means I only need one zombie, and I've perturbed the system. That equilibrium will not be stable, which means I will have more zombies. I may not necessarily go to the doomsday equilibrium, but I will move away from the disease-free equilibrium. So my infection persists. Right, so I, I, I've changed my model. I've changed the outcome a little bit. Right, so I, I can't prove exactly that I go to the other equilibrium, but I prove that the disease is around. Now, if we model this, you can see it's slightly different. So I have this light blue class of infected individuals. So they come and go. Right, so first is some of them, and then they disappear. This is a very classic epidemic wave. So most diseases that come, they come in, do their damage, and then they go away at the end. Right, so you get this kind of, sort of you know, hump curve that's happening all the time. But other than that, it kind of looks a lot like the previous one, right? So you can see that, you know, all the humans are gone eventually. Many zombies appear, not quite as many as the original population, right? Because we're not, you know, we've killed some of them permanently, but not all of them. And what have we gained? We've gained four more days, right? So each, each infection event being delayed by 12 hours has, on the whole, given us eight days to survive instead of four. Okay, well, we got a slightly better outcome, but this is still not the ideal outcome that we want. OK, so let's, let's fight back. Let's be a bit more sophisticated in how we deal with things. Right? So let's try and quarantine some of the zombies. Right? What we're going to do is capture some of the zombies and put them in some giant cage. Right? Well, if I'm going to capture the zombies, I might also possibly capture people who've been infected and who are not yet zombies. I may have very different capture rates for these two individuals. Right? So I'm going to remove them. And the great thing about quarantine is once I'm quarantined, I can't do any damage. Right? So a zombie that's in a big cage can't infect any humans. Right, so that takes them out of the infection pool. Right, that's actually very handy. Right. Now, I need to mathematically worry about what happens to them eventually. Right, so I'm going to say, well, maybe they try and escape this cage, but they're going to be killed before they find their freedom. And maybe I set up snipers on the tower or some automatic system or whatever. And again, I assume that they could either be killed permanently or they could be killed temporarily. Okay, okay. here's my model again, right, with my susceptibles, my infected individuals, my zombies, my dead. Now I add in the quarantine class, right? but I'm quarantining two possible groups. Right? I'm either quarantining the infected individuals at some rate, or I'm quarantining the zombies at some other rate. And these rates are very likely to be different, because these are very different individuals I'm dealing with. Right? One group is very easy to capture. Right? My friend who's been infected, who's shaking and moaning uncontrollably, if I watched him be infected by a zombie, I know he's infected. So I can grab him and put him in a cage. Right? Now he may try and resist that, but what's he going to do? He's not going to bite me. He's just a person. Right? So I can capture him easily, but finding him is very difficult. Right? Because if I didn't watch him be infected and he doesn't tell me, I don't know if he's been infected or not. Right? Whereas a zombie, a zombie is very easy to recognize, right? easy to find, but hard to capture, because I run the risk then of being infected myself if I try and capture the zombie. And we see quite different rates here. Uh, the last term here is just to do something with the cues. I, I need to put them somewhere, so I'm going to, well, actually I'm going to put only some of them back into the dead class. OK, so here's my model. And uh, the, the Q class, what I've done is, so I've, I've taken out this, these are the individuals who have left the Q class, 
So the, the one minus Q is basically the, the zombies that I killed temporarily, and I may have killed some of them permanently. And I can vary that as I need to. So I'm taking zombies out of the, the I class and the Z class, right? So I'm taking them at a different rates here. So these kappa I and sigma Z come out, and they go into the Q class, and then I just, I just need to leave the Q class at some point. Otherwise, mathematically, things fall apart a bit. OK, so that's just accounting for what happens to them. I assume some of them are killed, some permanently, some temporarily. Um, and Q may be either 0 or it may be small, depending. OK, so if I have my short outbreak. Again, I can ignore the birth and death for now. I have my disease-free equilibrium, as always, which you always get from models. Right? And if Q is 0, I have coexistence. Oh, OK. Right, I have something quite different to the previous classes. Coexistence, that sounds great. Until you realize that maybe it's not quite so great. There's no humans, there's no infected individuals, it's coexistence of the zombies, the dead, and the quarantine. That's maybe not the ideal outcome. Okay, all right, so sadly no humans at this point. All right. uh, if Q is not zero, then this equilibrium is all zeros, and that actually means that, well, the whole system has collapsed. There's no humans, no zombies, no dead, no, no nobody. All right. So again, no outcome so far has been particularly good for us. All right, so, well, I'd like to know about stability. So what I need to do is have a measure of disease spread. So the basic reproductive ratio is a, a concept that's used in epidemic theory to basically tell you how many secondary infections you'll cause. So if, if I'm a zombie and I infect three people, and then they infect three, and they infect three, and so on, obviously the disease is spreading. But if on average I infect less than one person, so if it took 10 zombies to make nine, and those nine made eight, and eight made seven, the disease is shrinking. So I want this number to be smaller than one to get rid of the disease. Right. So I found my, my basic reproductive ratio here, and it depends on various factors. Right? So it depends on is beta, which is the transmission rate of zombies, which I have no control over. It depends on n, which is the total population, which I have no control over. Unless maybe I start murdering some people. Eh, maybe, right? but probably not. Right? It depends on rho, which is the activation rate of zombies, which I have no control over. Right? Uh, it depends on alpha. Right, which is the, the rate at which we are individually killing zombies. Now, maybe we have some control over that, but I assume we're probably killing zombies as much as we humanly can. So I assume that's already maximized. So the two parameters that I have the most control over here are this kappa and the sigma, the, the quarantine rates of the infected individuals and the zombies. Okay, so great. If I quarantine more people, I, or more individuals, I should be having a better outcome. Okay, so if I can increase my quarantine rate, I will lower my R0, and presume I can lower it below 1. But I have a problem here, right? If my population is large, so if n gets quite large, well, the, this value is approximately... Do have a spare battery? Oh, sorry. All right, sorry, this, this value then is approximately beta rho over rho plus kappa alpha, right? And so the only factor that I have real control over here is kappa, which is the rate at which I quarantine infected individuals, not the zombies, right? So the very people that I find it hard to identify, those actually really matter, right? If the population is large. Right? So it means I have to capture a lot of people who I don't know who they are, and if I ask you, hey, have you been bitten by a zombie lately? You're probably not gonna tell me because what am I gonna do? I'm gonna throw you in a big cage with zombies, right? <laughs> so, now it's already too late for you, you know that, I know that, but you're still not probably gonna answer me, right? So I could, in theory, stabilize my disease-free equilibrium, right? If I can reduce it below one, but in practice, I'm probably not going to, right? So if I quarantine enough people, I can, in theory, reduce R0, right? But quarantining a large percentage of individuals is unrealistic, right? I have infrastructure limitations. Um, identifying the infected individuals is very challenging, right? So in practice, I expect R0 to be greater than one. And if R0 is greater than one, that means my disease can invade. So. I'm stuck again with my zombies are persisting. So I, I haven't eliminated them. All right, well, let's run some simulations and see what happens, right? So here I've run it for quite a while, almost a year. Well, the humans were gone a long time ago, right? What's happening here is kind of the system is happening automatically. I mean, maybe my robots are doing the quarantining, right? I mean, without any humans to capture the zombies, maybe the quarantined individuals aren't doing quite what they're doing here. But if I was somehow automatically capturing zombies, this is what would happen. Right. Eventually, sort of the numbers are going down, but everybody's pretty much lost at this point. Okay, so now I'm going to ask for a bit of faith here. Let me go with the idea of treatment. Right? What if I could magically 
fewer zombies. Okay, all right, this is crazy, but just, just hang on with me for this fantastical idea that I'm presenting you here. Suppose I can cure zombies. Wild and wacky, but let's just suppose we can. All right, I can turn a zombie back into a human now. All right, great. So I can make an individual. So if I have a zombie nearby and I stick a needle into him, now that zombie comes back to being a human. I've got a new one on my army that can help fight the zombie army. Okay, great. All right, that gives me a, a better fighting chance, right, because I can increase my numbers. I'm going to ignore the quarantine, partly because it wasn't very useful. Uh, also, I've got a cure, right? So let's, let's go with this. That sounds great, right? The only requirement I'm going to say is that treatment doesn't provide immunity, right? So if I was, you know, infected by a zombie, became a zombie, somebody cured me, I can be infected again. Okay, so many diseases have this property, right? So what I've done is I've rewired my, my model, but only very slightly, right? So I've got the same model as always, right? But the only term that's different here is this CZ, right? So I can now go from the zombie class back to the susceptible. But this changes things a lot, right? Because if you think about it, if I was born as a human, right, and then I died of natural causes, went to R, I got reanimated as a zombie, then somebody cured me, I'm back to a human again, I got infected by a zombie, right, I became a zombie, I got killed by a human, I came back to life, I got cured again, I can move around a lot, right? It also means, well, if grandma died, and I'm really sad, well, I could resurrect grandma as a zombie, and I could cure her, I just brought grandma back to life. Right? This is great, right? I can cure the dead here. So, you know, this is why I'm asking for a bit of faith here, right? The, the implications are very large. This is also a good reminder of why I'm probably dealing with a short time scale. Okay, so here's my model with treatment. The only change is I've taken a plus C at the end. I've, basically, I've taken out the minus C from the, the Z equation. Right? So I've taken a minus C there, and I've put it into the susceptible humans. Right? So I've, I've only made one small rewiring here, but it has a huge impact. So I'm going to definitely think about a short time scale, otherwise I've you know, created Egyptian mummies can come back to life, I can do whatever, right? So uh, I'm going to have my disease-free equilibrium, as always, right? But now I have a survival equilibrium. Okay, this sounds a lot better, right? So now I have an equilibrium where I have humans and no zombies, right? So this is great, right? Finally, finally, for the first time, I have some humans surviving. Okay, great. And that equilibrium is stable, so that's really good, right? That means this is very likely to be my long-term outcome, right? Um, what I need to do, though, is I need to cure zombies fast enough, right? I need to cure them faster than a critical rate, right? If I can do that, then I stabilize my disease-free equilibrium, right? So I have what's called bi-stability. I have two equilibria that are both stable, so it depends on where I start initially, right? But both equilibria seem pretty good, right? Now, in practice, it's not likely to return to my disease-free state because I, the, the critical rate at which I have to cure them is very fast, right? In fact, I would have to cure each zombie within five hours, 20 minutes of activation on average, right? So that's a very, very challenging thing to do, right? So I'd have to find all the zombies and very quickly, well, you know, assume I have enough resources to, you know, give needles to all of them, bring them all back. That's probably not going to happen. So I'm probably not talking about my disease-free equilibrium. I'm probably talking about my survival equilibrium at the top there. But that's great, right? I have a survival equilibrium. I have some humans. Well, not that many, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do have them. I do have, I don't kill all the humans, but it's a bunch of people in a shopping mall somewhere, right? <laughs> that's what we're talking about here, right? And they're in there for a long time. I mean, hopefully it's a well-stocked shopping mall because they're in there for close to a year before the zombies go down to zero, right? So eventually the zombies do go away, right? But it takes a while. So, I mean, also, we all know what's going to happen, right? You know, Bunch of people at a shopping mall, some idiot in my group is going to open the door to the zombies. We just know that's going to happen. The zombies come in, you know, this is all bad, right? We've got to bring them back to life. Yeah. Now, I should say, at the equilibrium, it's not that we're just stuck with this number, right? We're at an equilibrium, which means for every human that's infected by a zombie, well, we equally cure one zombie and bring them back into our, our team, right? So, so we may not be static, but we're at equilibrium. All right. So let's have another intervention. Um, and this is something I'm going to call impulsive attacks. Right, so the idea is that I want to pull my resources. Right? So instead of just kind of fighting the zombies one-on-one -on -one whenever they happen to walk into the room, let's try and be a bit more strategic. Right? Let's pull in larger resources. Let's call in the army. Right? Let's kind of think about what we can do as a collective. Because we have one great advantage that the zombies don't. Right? What do the zombies do? Right? They come after us. They come after us in large numbers. They don't need to eat or sleep or recharge or anything. They just keep coming and coming and coming. This is really bad. Right? What do we have? We have one huge advantage, brains, right? <laughs> the very thing the zombies are trying to eat. I don't think that's a coincidence, right? So we can outthink the zombies, right? We can build moats, we can electrify fences, right? We can do all kinds of sophisticated things if we have enough resources, 
right? So the resource issue is a problem because civilization is falling apart in front of us, right? So we do what we can, but we also have the idea of interdependence, right? So, you know, I may not be very good at you know, certain tasks, but if you're good at that that I can't do, I can do some things, you can do some things, we can build a kind of interdependent society, right? Actually, the kind of lesson we learn is society in the first place was actually pretty good, right? I don't have to be good at everything, I only have to be good at some things because there are other people around who have, have other skills. So let's try and pull our resources, right? So, well, trying to do this continuously is a huge dream, right? So we could pull our resources and try and do it all the time. But what we're better off doing is being strategic about it, right? So we're gonna pick a time and do something, and then we're gonna wait, learn some lessons, and do it again, but better, right? So we wanna learn some lessons here, right? And we get what's called an impulsive effect. So let me just talk about that for a second, right? Uh, what we're doing is we're saying that I'm having a massive attack on the zombies. I'm doing something very, very quickly, and I'm gonna say that because it's so quick, I'm gonna take the time that it, it requires to zero. I'm gonna say that it happens instantaneously. Right? I, I attack the zombies so fast that it might as well have been just this lightning strike that it's done. And now that's obviously an approximation, right? but it turns out it's a valid approximation if that time is small compared to the time between attacks. Right? So if I attack them once a day in a sort of 20 minute blitz, that's fine because you know, 24 hours between those attacks is quite large. So what we get is we get a difference equation here. This tells us what happens immediately after the attack minus immediately before the attack, right? Those things won't be zero, right? So it says that I'm, I'm jumping up in an in instantaneous jump, right? And in general, that depends on the time at which I do it or the state at which the system is in. Right? So that may be that I only attack when there's enough zombies or I maybe just only attack at noon each day or some combination thereof. So there's many things I could do. I'm just gonna attack them, say, once a day. So what I have is I have continuous solutions between attacks, and then when I undergo one of these attacks, there's an instantaneous jump, right? So I've kind of got a shock to the system. Right? And this is reasonable if your, your cycle times are large. So what I have is I have a system of differential equations like before, but now I have a difference equation for these, these shocks only at certain times. So let me go back to the first model, right? the worst one, the one that only gave us four days of survival. Right? So I'm gonna take the first three equations through exactly that first model, what I'm doing is saying, okay, for when I'm not at that attack time, so when T is not equal to Tn, which is exactly that model from before, right? we don't have much time to deal with them. When I'm at one of these attack times at a Tn, then I have a change in the zombies, so that delta Z is saying I'm changing the zombie numbers by three things. Right? Well, I have a, a minus, which means I'm decreasing the zombies, I'm killing them, K is the kill rate, and N is the, the number of tries that I have. Right? So K is the sort of basic ability for me to attack, attack zombies, right? And then N is the number of attacks that I need until KN is larger than one. What this really means is I'm attacking them and then I attack them again, but better, right? So I learn lessons from each time, right? So I'm using my, my brains, right, to learn things to become smarter at it, right? So I'm hitting the zombies, then I'm gonna hit them again with ever increasing force, okay? So what we see is you get these attacks, right? And then you attack again, and then you attack again, right? So I do actually stop the zombies, Right? And I stopped them in a short time. Right? All the previous ones, even if I had some humans surviving, it took close to a year. Here I can do it within my time frame. Right? I do it within eight days if I attack them. Right? And you can see that, that at the first, you know, I'm not attacking them very efficiently. Like the first attack, well, actually, there's a, there's a first attack much further down that's very poor. You, you basically don't see it. Right? The first one you do see seems pretty weak, but this later attack is very, very effective. Right? And then the, the last one here is you've wiped them out. And so, okay, the humans don't do so well out of it, but the problem is solved at least quickly, right? We've gotten rid of the zombies, we've done it by basically attacking them very efficiently again and again and again, learning lessons each time. All right, so let me return to my original model here and let's summarize what we did, right? So we had our basic model, right? And then we tried quarantine, which took some zombies away, right? And we saw that didn't really seem to work too well, right? We tried a cure, which returned the zombies back to being humans, and that yeah, sort of kind of worked, right? Not, not as good as we might have thought. And then we had these impulsive attacks, which is a different way of taking out zombies, and we saw this was a much more efficient way, right? Of all the methods we tried, this one dealt with the problem at least quickly, and it also eradicated the zombies, leaving only humans. Not that many of them, but it left some. Okay, so let me summarize. We need extremely aggressive tactics, right? Zombies are not something that we can just kind of sit around and hope for the best with. We have to fight back. We have to fight back very, very intensely. Right? So quarantine is not going to save us. Uh, treatment takes a long, long time. Also relies on having a cure, which we may not have. 
right? We need to hope that somebody's brilliant enough to invent a cure within the first four days, eight days. That's, that's a hard, hard ask, right? Only frequent attacks with increasing force is gonna result in eradication, assuming the available resources can be mustered in time. We can do it, but we have to hit them, and we have to hit them hard, and then harder, and harder, and harder. Right? So it's a beautiful combination of, you know, using our brains and our intelligence and learning, and mindless violence. Right? So if those two things, we, we can solve the zombie problem. Right? So a couple of limitations here, right? I was setting the birth and death rates to be zero. What if I don't do that? Right? What if I don't think about a short time scale? What if I have a much longer time scale? Well, then I have a bigger problem. I have a doomsday scenario. Well, that sounds pretty bad, right? So what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a complete collapse of civilization, right? So every human gets infected or dead, and part of the reason here is because basically if you've got more babies coming in and growing up and basically providing more fodder for the zombies. Because what happens to my baby, right? My baby becomes an adult, my baby gets infected at some point and becomes an infected individual, becomes a zombie, you know, dies, comes back to life, you know, as a zombie. I basically, I'm creating humans who can just become zombies or I'm creating the dead which can become zombies. Because the dead are part of my model, once you come in as a human, you kind of don't really leave. The only way to leave is to be permanently killed as a zombie, right, which we saw didn't actually have that much effect in the long run. Right? So we basically have this limitless supply of new bodies to infect, resurrect, and convert. Right? So what that means is, if zombies arrive, we have to act quickly and decisively to eradicate them before they eradicate us. Right? We have a small window of opportunity, and this is true of most diseases, in fact. Right? When new diseases turn up, there's a window, and if you act quickly and intensely, you can stop that disease in its tracks. Did that for SARS? We didn't do it for most diseases. It was well known when HIV came in the 80s that we had a window and we did not act. HIV is now the ninth worst killer of all, of all diseases of all time. Right? So you, you lose the opportunity there. Okay, so zombie outbreak is likely to be a really bad thing, right? Unless we can deal with it quickly. Right? Uh, quarantine is not going to contain the epidemic. Uh, a cure can lead to survival, but in very low numbers over a very long time scale. Right? But the most effective way to to contain the rise of the undead is to hit hard and hit often. So it is imperative that zombies are dealt with quickly or else we're all in a great deal of trouble. Okay, so I would just like to acknowledge my students who also worked on this. Um, if anyone's interested in reading the original paper or various follow-ups I've done, um, you can just well, either Google me or look on my website. Uh, and yes, that's basically the end of my part. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentations. Thanks to both of you. Uh, lots of uh, takeaways there. I know now I've got a big long list of uh, zombie films to watch, including, of course, Zombie versus Shark, because you know I want to figure out the social significance there. And uh, I know that if a zombie apocalypse hits Waterloo campus, I've got to make my way to one of the math buildings, although I hope the modeling gets a little bit more promising, but you know, it's, it's coming along. Um, so we're going to move into Q&A in just a moment. Uh, but I'll give you just a few more minutes to think of your questions if you're feeling a bit zombified, um, and uh, just tell you a little bit about some upcoming lectures uh, at uh, St. Jerome's. Uh, so the next lecture in the St. Jerome's University Lectures in Catholic Experience takes place on Friday, November the 15th. Uh, it's entitled The Paradox of Pleasure, Jean Vanier and the Growth of L'Arche, presented by Carolyn Whitney Brown, author of Sharing Life, Stories of L'Arche Founders. And the reading series continues on Friday, November the 22nd with author Deanna Young, who has been nominated for numerous awards and has written four books of poetry. So for details about these upcoming lectures, you can check them out on the St. Jerome's website, www.sju.ca. Uh, registration for a number of these is required in advance, but everybody's uh, welcome to attend. Okay, so we're, we're gonna move into the Q&A session now. Uh, we do have some mic runners, and so I ask if you have a question, please wait until you're given a mic, because of course we're recording uh, today's uh, presentations and, and the Q&A, and so, okay, we've got a couple of mic runners, and I, I'll ask our speakers to come up here. I'm supposed to stay at the podium, because I'm not mic'd, so. Um, right, so, uh, okay, we have a question here. Uh, this is for both of you. If you take your generic zombie in the zombie movies, how do they fit the model? How does a generic zombie fit the model? 
Yeah. Is there a generic yes. zombie? Yeah. Uh, well, so, so I will say we, we were specifically thinking about the slow zombie, right? And, and my, I mean, I talked a little too about this. You know, yes. the, the, there's, there's often a big competition between the fast zombie versus the slow zombie. And my students were, they were zombie traditionalists. They were like, nope, nope, we're only dealing with the slow zombie, right? <laughs> and, and I think kind of showing that the slow zombie can wipe out, you know, a city in four days is, is pretty good advertisement for why the slow zombie is still scary. And I actually started thinking about it as kind of a metaphor for disease. Like if you have Ebola, that's like the fast zombie. Ebola comes at you pretty hard. If you're in the way of Ebola, it's, it's pretty terrible. But it's actually a very inefficient disease because it burns up its host too quickly. Right? You, you infect a village, the village all dies. It doesn't spread very easily. Right? HIV is a much more stealth disease. It moves very slowly. You get infected. It's 10 years before you, you die of it. It's eight years before you even notice anything. Right? And in that time, you have a long time to sort of quietly spread it around. Right? So I think that's, a, that's, for me, a big argument for why the, the slow zombie is kind of useful. I'll go yeah. along with that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Out of curiosity, for the zombie modeling, was it based on like actual biological modeling for like different diseases? And if so, like how's the zombie one like adapted? Uh, yes. So, so yes, it was in the sense of it actually came out of a mathematical modeling of disease cause. And so we were learning how to model diseases. And so they were modeling you know, malaria and and things like that. And so the, the, the baseline stuff, so how to get the infection rates, how to get the recovery rates, and so on, were all general things that you use to develop models for new diseases. So for example, for the flu each year, you, when you have to have the flu shot, right, they, they have to figure out what's happening in two years' time. So right now, they're working on vaccines for the flu in 2021. Right? So you have to know how the flu is going to mutate each year, because it, it drifts each year. And so you're trying to have models which are trying to guess that. So we're doing these models all the time. And so it was basically teaching how the models work. And so then, well, I sent my students away to watch a lot of zombie movies, played a lot of video games. And they came in at one point, they said, oh, you know, we've, we've got some, some results here. And I said, oh, look, you know, I've seen the movies, it doesn't work like this. Said, oh, yeah, you're right. Go home and watch some more movies. Said, oh, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah. Hi, so I, I wanted to ask about, uh, you were mentioning the impact of zombies as um, like a foreign media that has an impact on our culture, what would you say is um, one of the biggest philosophical impacts it has left on our culture as a whole? That's a great question. Um, well, I guess I would point to The Walking Dead itself to start with in the sense that the television adaptation of the comic, when that started in 2010, Walking Dead became, like I was saying earlier, one of the biggest television shows on the planet. And only in the last few years has it actually started to go down in ratings. It's actually, for so many years in the show, been the most popular thing. So in a sense, we can look at that show and say that show is the brand as far as the impact of this creature is in the modern era. And so you'd look to that show for what is the biggest philosophical impact that it has. And largely what that show does is tell the same story over and over again. And I mean, I, you could argue that's a criticism. I mean, that, that's for another time of be saying, yes, that's a genuine criticism too. But on a, on a meaning level, the idea is what that show does is in a cyclical way, it keeps telling the same story, which is how do we value each other as human beings? What is a human life worth? And when push comes to shove and you're trapped you know, in a place with other people, who is it that you're going to turn to for support? Who is it that you're going to uh, consider outsiders? It's basic exercises in a study of human nature and how we value one another. And actually, of course, one of the biggest lessons I think we could learn right now is the desperate need for more empathy in the world. And in a sense, The Walking Dead has often explored the moral and ethical issues of whether or not empathy is a danger. In some respects, actually, I'd argue The Walking Dead has done a lot to, to damage some things by uh, reinforcing the notion that sometimes you have to make hard choices. Yes, in an apocalypse, maybe. Um, <laughs> but in the real world, it would be nicer for people to be united a bit more. So I think that, that exploration is what I think is the biggest impact right now. And that show has been the vehicle for it for a very long time. That answer. In thinking about your mathematical model, have you ever thought about including instability in the latency period so that the latency changes over time? Oh, that's a great suggestion, actually. Um, so I would say one of the things about modeling is you, you're kind of picking, you know, the average, the average 
person, the average zombie, the average dead individual, the average rate of change for infection, the average latency, and so on. And you want to kind of stress test this against what if the average is very meaning, meaningful and what if it's not so meaningful, right? What if small changes give you a totally different result, right? So you try and kind of stress test all of these to say what if, you know, maybe it's 12 hours, but what if it was 13 and what if it was 11, right? What if it was 24, what if it was one, right? And so, you know, there's great techniques where you can do that. You can basically sample across all the parameter space and kind of, you know, pick and choose to get a, a sort of full sense of what's possible, but also what's not possible, which is sometimes quite helpful too, right? And so that, that sometimes guides you in developing experiments. You might say, well, you know, these things are all possible, but these ones won't happen, so don't waste your money in running experiments on this. So we, we do that a lot for, you know, real diseases. Um, so in terms of the zombies, I, I like this idea a lot, actually, because I think that, yeah, the latency is something that we only really observe, right? It's kind of, you know, you may have seen someone get infected, and then it's a while before they become a zombie, and we're not really measuring it very scientifically, right? In an apocalypse, of course, you're just saying, okay, well, you know, my friend started to become a zombie after a while. Let's say, let's call it 12 hours. That seems about right, right? But what if it's quite varying? And it may, of course, depend on the person's immune system, right? It may depend on you know, how much virus the zombie was carrying, who bit them. Uh, there's all kinds of factors that are kind of not explicitly modeled, but they're in the system anyway. And so all those things, you kind of hope that small variations only produce small differences in outcome, but they might not, right? It's sometimes that, you know, tiny variations can cause catastrophically different results. And you want to be aware of that if those are going to happen, you should hopefully know that they're going to happen. So, so whole branches of like chaos theory will deal with those things, whereas you have sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and so, you know, parameters that are very little bit, and they're going to have a massive outcome, you really want to know about that because you can't rely on just single variable. Following up again on culture, I do recall there's an All Saints Day at the end of October, followed by a day commemorating the dead. And I recall on TV watching Mexicans getting dressed up as the dead. Is there a connection there between zombies and this cultural phenomenon? There, there, uh, the Mexican Day of the Dead in that tradition is generally disconnected from the origins of the zombie as a character in film and television and pop culture. But over the years, it's become very entwined with it in terms of design and style and people co-opting a lot of that in a way that many people that see that as a, you know, as a cultural tradition also see as cultural appropriation and, and stealing of things that for them means a very different thing than what a lot of the things we're talking about here today mean. But you see a lot of that now intertwined with Halloween and, and with monsters to the point where now every time around this time of year, you see sugar skull designs, you mm -hmm. see all those kind of things that are associated with that, and, uh, and that makes things a little murkier. So for the most part, in terms of the zombie and pop culture, that's very disassociated from it. But it has become very much a part of it in, in sort of the, the merchandising and the, the pop culture angle. Yeah. Uh, the Night of the Living Dead is a very uh, sort of dense film in terms of social commentary. Uh, so can you sort of talk a little bit about what the directors were sort of trying to say, what issues they were uh, sort of trying to bring up? Sure. I mean, uh, short version is that uh, if you talk to just about anybody related to the actual film, they'll say they weren't thinking of anything. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the short answer. Uh, they started taking more and more credit for it as the years went on because when you're told long enough that you're a genius, it's a good <laughs> idea to just, yeah, you're right, we kind of did. Um, but I'll tell you one story because um, I'll tell you one story quickly, which is that, that honestly, most of the people from Romero on down to the writers to the production team, they all thought they were making a midnight horror movie that they can sell and, and send to theaters. And what any of them might have thought in their hearts about meaning that may have come into it most of them keep to themselves. I don't know why, but I feel like, for some reason, they feel like it's better if they just leave that out. But there's one person who felt that it meant something, and that was the star, Dwayne Jones, who's no longer with us. He died, actually, at the 20th anniversary of the show in 1988, and he always hated being associated with the movie. He was an academic himself, he was a professor. He wanted to be asked about things like history and politics, and everybody would just don't come up to him and say, hey, you're Ben from Night of the Living Dead and he hated it, and right before his death, he did a radio interview where he finally talked about everything. And uh, keep trying to get short. He told a quick story that I love that sounds much better coming from him, and if you go online, look on YouTube, you will surely find this radio interview, and I highly recommend listening to it. 
But he told a story about how one night they were driving him home from the night shooting they shot at this abandoned farmhouse, and a friend of his who was playing one of the ghouls, this woman, was driving him home in her truck, and they were driving through downtown Pittsburgh at like 3, 4 in the morning. They were the only people on the road until they saw headlights coming, and another truck pulled up alongside them, and it was filled with a group of white kids with one of them brandishing a tire iron at them. And he said it suddenly occurred to him they were seeing a black man being driven home by a white woman at 4 o'clock in the morning in Pittsburgh, and they weren't happy about it. And he said, fortunately, they knew how to wind their way through the roads, and they lost them, and they got home. And he said when he was home, he reflected on the fact that earlier that evening, he was shooting the scene where he was killing zombies with a tire iron. And he said that to him crystallized what he was doing in that movie and why he felt it meant something that he was in that film. So even if nobody else making Night of the Living Dead was thinking of something more meaningful, Dwayne Jones was thinking of something. And, uh, and I, I love that story. That really crystallizes it. So thank you both for your talks. Um, my question is to you, both of you. Um, if you had to come back as a zombie, which type of zombie would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, I know I wouldn't make it at all, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, this, this is the funny thing. Everybody always thinks they're going to survive, right? You know, you always think, oh, I've got my zombie survival plan, you know, I'm going to be... But everybody thinks that. And the chances are not good, right? You're probably going to become a zombie, right? You know, I, I'm just like, yep, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like, take me, overlords. I'm, I'm going to submit to the zombie. It's, it's very likely going to become a zombie. So for me, I guess I'd rather be the slow zombie. I just, I feel like that to me feels like the classical zombie. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that. Yeah. I would go with that too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sort of like the question of what's your favorite and still to me, yeah. the slow zombie. And I mm -hmm. figure it's, uh, there's a, John Leguizamo plays a character in Romero's Land of the Dead in 2005. And uh, there's a point where he's asked the age old question that comes up in these movies and like his friend's going to kill him, like a mercy mm -hmm. killing because he's been bitten. And he's like, nah, I always wanted to see how the other half lives. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> so um, you talked a lot about Walking Dead as a, as a pinnacle of modern zombie television. But uh, it seems to me that uh, in terms of a, a TV that's had a huge cultural impact, Game of Thrones should be up there as well. Sure. And I'm curious to what extent you know, how you regard Game of Thrones as fitting into genre, the zombie genre and, you know, to what extent the people who created it were thinking about zombies when they created their Walking Dead. Well, what's interesting about Game of Thrones is that it and many other shows were sort of existing in the wake of The Walking Dead in a certain respect, when, certainly whenever it touches on those kind of themes. And obviously Game of Thrones is, is its own cultural phenomenon in so many other ways. But um, I, I'm not personally a fan, not, not that I think it's bad in any way, I just never got into it. But I watched a few things here and there because I still like to know some things that are going on pop culture-wise. And I saw the episode, I'm sure if anyone's a fan, they know, the thing was called Hard Home. Uh, it, was like, it was the episode at the time where the, the White Walkers arrive and attack the town. And uh, at the time, I thought to myself, this was more, uh, uh, more of a potent representation of this concept of the zombie in pop culture in that episode than I saw in an entire season's worth of The Walking Dead. Because after a certain point, like I was saying earlier, The Walking Dead has told its story. It just keeps telling that story. But Game of Thrones had some interesting new twists, and its creatures were themselves frightening and fearful in a whole variety of different ways. And to me, the, the shot that made it was the last shot of that episode where the last few survivors are sailing away in the boat and they look back and the leader of the, the walkers or the evil group is standing there on the shore and just does this and all of the dead rise up. And it perfectly you know, illustrates one of your points too, is the idea of like every living person is just fodder to join the army That's of right, the yeah. dead. <laughs> they can't be stopped. There was a, um, a chill to that, an a, a impact that I think was so powerful. And I think that Game of Thrones has done a lot to show that there's still new and interesting things you can do with this. Uh, American Horror Story is another good example, too. Because it's done something different. Yeah. Um, my wife and daughter and I are here, and I'm just wondering whether I can sleep tonight. Uh, <laughs> 
And specifically, I'm bringing it back to like World Health Organization and, and your comment about these mathematical models are used and very applicable, I think, uh, to a lot of the diseases that we've seen so far and certainly in the last 20 years. So um, I guess uh, I, I'm just wondering if you foresee or if you have seen with the diseases that have been around the last 20, 30, 50 years or back to the plague, how close are we to the edge and how often are we close to the edge and right. how often could we be close to the edge? I want to know this too, Robert. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, yes, I, I've, I mean, the, the disease that keeps me awake at night is avian influenza, right? So, so what avian influenza does is birds get the flu and humans get the flu. But if a bird sneezes and the droplets come down and you already have the flu and you catch the bird's flu, what happens is in your own body, the two mix and it's like your own body becomes a lab and it creates a new virus. So every human becomes a new lab for a new kind of virus. So every avian influenza case is, is somewhat different. Right? So it only takes one kind of mutation and then that mutation is now airborne right? and you have a very deadly disease that can hop across. Now we haven't seen too many kind of you know, apocalyptic diseases in some time. Right, so we had, you know, 1918 Spanish influenza. Uh, that was that was very serious, and that ran across. You know, I mean, that killed about as many people as the plague, but it did it in six months, whereas the, you know, Black Plague took like 200 years. So, you know, we had a very serious one about 100 years ago, but we haven't really had too much since. Right, we had more stealthy ones like HIV and stuff, but those are ones we managed to live with and so on. Right? Um, even influenza is the one that is, I think is the ticking time bomb. Right, and also most diseases tend to jump from animals, so. There's one that jumps from animals as well. Right? We work and live with animals in ways that we historically haven't, and so we often have you know, much larger numbers. Um, animals live in very close proximity in a lot of farms and so on, so they can sweep through very quickly. Um, so the right kind of mutation could make things very serious. Now, let me bring this back to zombies. All right. <laughs> how, how do we actually survive the zombie outbreak? All right, so I said before, we're probably all going to become zombies. All right? But that's maybe not quite true. So why did we survive the plague? All right? Some people survived the plague because they had a chance mutation. Right? They were missing a receptor on a T cell, and so it meant the virus couldn't attach to their cells. Right? So they caught the plague, but it didn't do anything in their body. Right? So now that was just a very chancy thing. There was a couple of people here and there. Right? But over the hundreds of years since, about 10% of the European population is now missing that receptor. Right? And, so, and they have immunity some other, to some other diseases as a result. Right? So a chance mutation gave you a genetic advantage Evolution happened, and so now these people's descendants were more likely to be selected for, and it passed through. So if the zombie virus comes along, right, and if we happen to have a chance mutation that makes us immune to the zombie virus, people like that will have an advantage. Maybe very few, but this is why I think civilization is not ultimately going to win, right, or at least humanity is not going to win, because some people will have a natural immunity to whatever it is. Now, you're not immune to having your arm torn off, right, so the <laughs> zombie can really kill you anyway, but if enough people have the right mutation, enough people survive, and then their children survive, and so on, and eventually we kind of beat back the zombie horde, right, and then we, we take over again. So in the long term, considering all of us, eventually some of us will survive. Individually, maybe not so, so happy, but you know, it's, you know, eventually I think, I think life, life does go on. Right? It just may go on in a new form, and we may not get back what we had. But I think a lot of the zombie stuff, which is probably you know, your point, is like it's a lot about kind of looking back and thinking about the you know, sort of, you know, like, you know, me versus nature, right? You know, could I survive when I don't have any civilization? And what does that mean? And that's a very kind of romantic idea of like, you know, oh, if I didn't have all my technology and so on, just me in the wild and fighting off creatures and stuff. I mean, that used to be our day job many, many, many millennia ago. <laughs> that's what we all did was fight off nature and try and survive. And we don't do that now because we've got a much better method for surviving. Right? But it's, it's, it's very appealing to think about that. And I think if an apocalyptic disease comes, we actually will be faced with that. But I think zombies represent two major threats that every human being is terrified of, right? One is being eaten by a predator, and one is being killed by a disease. These are pretty random things, and we don't have any predators, really, that are going to do us any serious damage, but we do have diseases, and the diseases do run the risk of potentially escaping, and then there's a lot of us now, and we also move around very quickly, so we can, we can become vectors of this disease very fast. So it is possible that actually something like that could, could wipe a lot of us out, but it's not going to wipe us all out. I also point out, too, that that actually has been, they've played with some aspects of that in a lot mm -hmm. of these stories, and this idea, like you were saying, about um, developing an immunity. Mm -hmm. Like in one of those shows I was mentioning, Z Nation, there was a character who basically became a mutant because he, was, he could survive 
that he yeah. was like in the middle. Mm -hmm. But that whole Richard Matheson's I Am Legend is about exactly that, the idea that the, the virus transforms people into the next step. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you're trying to survive against them, it, you, you flip the, the world over and they are now the ones in control and they're the mm -hmm. next step. So like you say, you know, we'd survive but in a different form. And they've played with that idea too in a lot of these stories. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm fascinated also watching your, your stuff. Like, what an endlessly rich amount of text there is when and, you just add zombies. And yet people uh, yeah. keep saying the zombies yeah. are over. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but they're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one more yeah. question about your disease model. I, it, the mm -hmm. most infectious disease is the rate of um, transmission or exposure will, will affect you know, the response. Yeah. Have, and clearly with a zombie, you have to be bitten. But what happens if the bite is of differential depth? Or mm. if it's the blood of the zombie and it could be by coughing on somebody or mm. droplet inhalation or something. Has that ever been uh, put into any of your models? Uh, actually, yes. It's, it's already in the model because in the term beta, so that was my, my beta SZ, which is the rate of infection here, that rate is not fixed in my general model. So I let that rate be any number it likes. This is the great thing about mathematics, right? I mean, I say the biggest advantage of mathematics is it can do something that almost nothing else can do, which is it can predict the future. Right? Now, you know, there's math and crystal balls. That's about all we've got, right? <laughs> so if I want to know the future, math can actually tell me this. Now, the trade-off is, of course, it can tell me a lot of futures at once. So I can tell for anything from sort of, you know, it never transmits to it always transmits, right? And you can actually run the whole gamut of these things, and all the parameters at the same time can run between all the different values. So, in fact, people have taken the zombie model and applied it to specific diseases. They said, well, what if it's not quite as infectious? Well, actually, the zombie model matches quite well to um, a model of, I think, smallpox and stuff like that. You can, with, the, with the lower parameter, you can move stuff around. Of course, the dead are not coming back to life. Um, Ebola is actually quite a good uh, match to, to zombies because although the dead aren't walking around and trying to eat you, they're still infectious. Right? And so they're not coming back to life, but they are infectious, and so you have to account for those. So it's basically just a reshuffling these parameters. So what we do is we actually, you know, by doing the zombie model, which is of course a fun thing to do, you actually also learn lessons about how other models work with other diseases. I was actually working on a model of human papillomavirus with a colleague, um, and, and she said, like, we, we were, most of the models had only looked at heterosexual transmission, and we were adding in homosexual transmission, and, and then she said, oh, but isn't this going to be really complicated? Like, we're going to have these two mass action terms. I said, oh, I've done this before with the zombies. That's the infection rate and the attack rate. <laughs> She's like, are zombies going to help us solve real problems? <laughs> Like, well, there you go. So, yes. Yeah, so, so the short answer is yes, it, 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 it can be considered and it is considered, um, partly because also if you don't know the number exactly, and with zombies we don't really, I mean, we can look at all the video games and movies and stuff, but we're not going to really know it. You then want to say, what if it's every possible value and what, what possible outcomes can there be? So, yes, if the zombie transformed from a bite, which, you know, requires a specific contact, right, if a zombie never bites you, you have no chance of being infected. But if it becomes airborne, then suddenly you can be infected even if you never meet a zombie in your life. So, so all those things can matter, and they can really change the nature of the disease. Hi. Uh, sorry. Um, if you were to make the assumption that you could identify individuals who had been affected if you removed the stealth component and assumed that you could mm -hmm. act preemptively, do you see that as having any effect on the survival rate or the survival time period, or do you see it oh, as yes. an inconsequential variable towards the doomsday apocalypse? No, I think, I think that would actually make a massive difference, right? So, so if you had symptoms upon being bitten, Right? So you know, maybe you, you got a shake or you got a fever or something like that that was readily identifiable, and then people really knew, okay, because you've had that symptom, then I can identify you and quarantine you. You can reduce R0 below 1 quite easily. Right? So, so that's a parameter that you can control and you can maximize, and you can trip that threshold very easily. And if you can trip the threshold, what you're effectively doing is you're restabilizing your disease-free equilibrium. And so now a zombie outbreak can be controlled if we can basically take enough people out. And, and really what we're learning is enough key people. So if we can take out the infected individuals, of course, we're trying to kill the zombies to protect ourselves at the same time, but we can remove some people from the population. That would probably make all the difference. It's really the stealth nature that makes this a really difficult problem. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm just wondering, um, if you sort of take into account the, the mathematical model that we'd probably all die as a result of, of zombies, <laughs> could you sort of look at the, the, sub, the philosophical subtext of zombies um, as we really have to appreciate the, the lives we have, because being immortal isn't going to be that great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you're immortal as a zombie, I mean, is that really good or not? Yeah, I, I actually, I do think that zombies do help us appreciate what we have. 
um, I think because you know, the, the collapse of civilization and this kind of you know, romantic idea of let's go back to a simpler time, actually what you learn is that's not so good. Mm -hmm. right? that's, that's no kind of fun, actually. Yep. That was a terrible idea. Right? It seems romantic because it's gone, but actually you know, I, I think I would not do so well in the wild. Right? Mm -hmm. If it's just fighting lions or something, I'm, I'm going to be eaten, let's face it. Right? It's, you know, the, the, the skills I have are not well suited to that kind of thing. And, and so I think you start to appreciate both, you know, well, I have a lot of comforts. I don't have to worry about shelter and food and so on. I live in an abundant society. Right? Mm -hmm. I also don't have to be good at everything. I'd right? have other people who can, you know, analyze movies. I don't have time to watch them. <laughs> I can do the math. That's me. Because you don't want to do that. You know, yeah, we, we yeah. work together and we, we <laughs> come out stronger as, as a group. Right? And I think that, that tells you that actually society is pretty, pretty good, actually, in some ways. Right? And, you know, as much as we have very legitimate criticisms of society, there's also a lot that's actually very powerful about it. It's also very romantic because if you watch The Walking Dead, Daryl looks like he still has a lot of hair product. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's just natural just, bounce. Really. It's really yeah. amazing in the apocalypse yeah. How, yeah, how pretty he looks. Um, There's, so if we consider... No, go ahead. And then okay. Uh, if we consider uh, the disease spreading over other countries, continents, and so, uh, so uh, would that change the model in any way? Uh, yes, so, so what you would probably do is you would look at each region, be it country or continent or whatever, as its own kind of little sort of crucible. You say, okay, well, you're going to spread locally here, but then you, you kind of rewire the network. Say, well, I have some local spread, but you have a couple of global jumps, right? And so either, you know, if there's still planes operating, you know, a few people fly and they take the disease over, and then you kind of restart it there. Now you have a new single infected individual who is now creating new people, and since our disease-free equilibrium is unstable, it starts again, right? And then it sort of goes locally and then it jumps again. And so you kind of, you, you call this a small world network. You say you have local connections, but you'll have a few global connections. And what you can show is you don't need very many global connections before you can spread very efficiently, right? This is actually exactly how computer viruses work, right? So they, they target like, a, you know, like your computer and they kind of infect any computer that you're, you're connected to. They just, they just do it by just randomly picking, you know, your ISP number out of a hat infect locally and then just pick another one, right, and just jump over there and infect locally, right, and just jump over. That's a really efficient way to do this, right? It's very hard to guard against because if you just randomly get chosen or you're connected to somebody who's chosen, right, your, your virus is going to spread. Right? And small world networks have been shown to be a very, very efficient way of doing this, and it's mostly how diseases spread. Now, not always, because if it's a sexually transmitted disease, it's a very different network, right? I cannot be infected if I don't have sex with someone who's infected, right? So, so my network changes quite a bit, right? But if it's kind of a, you know, like if I'm, you know, going and biting your neck, Right, you know, I, I, as a zombie, I have roughly equal chance of doing that to everybody here. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm a little bit limited. If I'm, I'm the zombie, and I'm the only one here, I'm mostly going to affect people locally that I can reach. Right? But if people are moving around a bit, and uh, you know, I'm not stuck with you know, dead bodies in front of me and I can't get past them, I'm pretty likely to infect most people in this room, or at least have equal chance of infecting people in the room. Not true in reality exactly, but close enough. Right? So different diseases, of course, have different patterns here. Right? If, I, if I'm got an airborne disease and I sneeze and there's fans in the room that are mixing the air, you all roughly have equal chance of this. Even though the people closer to me probably have slightly more chance, it's still going to mix pretty well. And they've actually done experiments with people on planes and shown how infections move through the system. Mm. Turns out the best place to sit yeah. in the plane to avoid disease is the front of the plane. <laughs> Diseases just sweep their way to the back of the plane. The poor get mm. infected more. It's always the case. I, so, yeah. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was occurred to me what you were describing as the global spread. I think one of the most beautiful, simplest visual representations that I've ever seen in a movie, from mathematically from a layman's perspective, is at the end of Rise of the Planet of the Apes. There's a sequence at the end where they just show what you're describing, that node goes to another place, boom, and shows yeah. how the global effect can take place mm -hmm. very rapidly. Chilling. Yeah. As we see zombies diversifying into other forms of media, as especially video games, as you mentioned, such as like The Walking Dead video games or The Last of Us, how would you describe the video games' contributions to like our outlook on zombies and the philosophical natures? Oh, the the you know what's interesting is I always feel like talking about the gaming side of things is one of the areas I'm a little less versed in because it's one that I was never as personally invested in as certain other areas of media which I feel does it a disservice because I would also argue that probably gaming is possibly the most uh, uh, impactful in terms of the zombies' effect on pop culture because of just how ubiquitous the zombie, appropriately enough, 
became in the gaming world, and like I was joking at the end, which is true, you'd have tons of games where they do like a, a, a warfare game, and then suddenly be, yes, but you can now buy the zombie level and get the zombies. <laughs> sure. And that's partly a, an, a, an, uh, sort of an effect of the, the popularity of them seeping into media to the point where you also get things like Pride and Prejudice and zombies. Like, we want zombies in everything. Just put them in everything. But gaming, I think, is uh, highly impactful. Uh, and not all positive either. One thing that I would certainly say has happened, certainly in more recent years, is that this is also goes way beyond my areas of focus, but the whole impact of first-person shooters as games, for instance, the dehumanizing of the person on the other end of your gun, you know, playing the games. Well, zombies offer a great metaphor for making that easier because you can simply say, oh, it's fine, shoot it. It's not a person, it's just a zombie. You know, and, and then it gets a little more uncomfortable when you're actually playing games that are based in a real like World War historic event or something like that. They are wearing the uniform of some other culture or country, but you make them zombies, so it's okay, shoot them. You know, and so there, there are implications to that that are truly chilling. Uh, and I think the zombie as a pop culture construct has been a very easy way to make some of that a little easier for people. Um, but it also means that their popularity leads them to pop up in every kind of gaming experience. Everything from Call of Duty and Last of Us to things like Plants vs. Zombies and cute things. You know, and, and not all of that is wrong or you know, necessarily negative, but it just speaks to how powerful they are that they work so well in so many contexts. And gaming, I think, is a huge part of it. Absolutely. Well, I, th I think this is why we need the media literacy. <laughs> because, well, yeah. You can't just go into these things without questioning the assumptions and stuff. Actually, oh, what, so when I when I did my zombie stuff, one of my my old undergraduate friends he messaged me and he said, "I know what you're doing. I know what's going on. You're doing secret government experiments. You're just pretending they're zombies because you're not ethically allowed to like experiment on humans, but secretly you're preparing for this." I was like, "I have no comment to make at this time." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, on that note, great discussion. Thanks again to uh, Robert and to Arnold. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Just a few things I'd like to draw your attention to. We'd like to thank our committed sponsors at the University of Waterloo, faculties of arts, uh, science, and mathematics, and to our sponsors and hosts at St. Jerome's, of course. Uh, this collaboration has been key to the success of this series and to our ability to bring lectures from all over the world to Waterloo. Thank you as well to W Print for selling books that support further reading on tonight's topic of zombies. Please visit their table in the atrium after tonight's event. And a shout out to the organizers of this event, Alicia Kalensis, Paul Craig, and Benoit Charbonneau. Uh, the next lecture in the Bridges Lecture Series will take place on Friday, February the 7th. Our quest to open new spaces that extend wider and further than ever before promises immense scientific and technological milestones to be met. Astronomer Brenda Fry from the University of Arizona and Offret Leviathan, director of Harvard College's freshman seminar program and a lecturer on law and politics at Harvard's Department of Government will talk about opening spaces at this Bridges Lecture. Thanks again to everybody for coming out tonight and for your support of the lecture series. We look forward to seeing you at our next lecture on February the 7th, and we invite you all to come out into the atrium now for a reception. Good night and thank you. And watch out for zombies.